why don't we let's let's kick it off uh okay. sunny introduce yourself hi um, um sunny dominguez i've known you guys for how long oh my gosh Five. Since USC, USC like, yeah. we have a mutual friend who I met you through, Eduardo. Yeah, Eduardo. Um, and Shout out to Eduardo. Show. Yeah, I miss you, Eduardo. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, and um, yeah. what what do you do? Uh, what do you? How, what are you from? LA? I'm and... born and raised in Dallas, Texas. I actually have a religion degree from Baylor University. I didn't know that. Yeah, oh, you didn't know? That? No. no, I thought you did. Yeah, a degree in religion. Yeah. I was going to be a pastor or a minister of some sort, but I didn't want to be like a in charge of a church. I just wanted to be like a speaker kind of, but then I just I actually always wanted to be an actor. So I'm an actor, do improv, comedy writing. So that's my passion. Oh my gosh. Okay. But, wait. So you got to like, let's backtrack for a second. Okay. Uh, uh, um, so while you were going through and getting um, your degree, uh-huh. uh, at what point was the changeover into like, you know what, maybe this isn't. You know, maybe I have to go into acting. Well, I never wanted. I only did the, got the degree because it was something I was interested in personally. And people said, "Hey, you'd be a good pastor." I'm like, "Okay," but I had no design to actually ever be a pastor. Oh, interesting. <laughs> but I figured, why not learn about something that I enjoy? Yeah, which is Jesus and religion and Christianity and but other religions too, and look at it from a different perspective as opposed to what just the church tells you. Here you go, believe this stuff, but actually more with critical thinking. So that's what I attribute and like having been able to ask questions without fear of being like, don't ask these questions. It's like, oh, no, let's ask these questions. Let's go deep dive into these questions. Yeah. So, but then, yeah, there's too much church politics and stuff like. As with anything. Yeah. Really. Yeah. So that's why I was like, yeah, I don't think the church working at a church is my thing. Yeah. I'm a little too rebellious. Somebody said, yeah, Sonny, you're, a, you're, you're a rebel who knows the rules. I'm like, that's a good <laughs> definition of who I am. Interesting. So, how long have you lived in LA then? You, uh, you were. This is from Texas. Yeah. So I've been out here since 2005, and I wait tables. As you do when you act, yeah, and exactly, so you're, you're doing yeah, your side actor. job as you're. Ex- yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Yeah. Um, and uh, as far as acting, what 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 would you love? What kind of roles would you love to play? What are you into? Uh, comedy, I think. Uh, and even though the sitcom has changed, that would be like my ultimate goal. Like. I Love Lucy and All in the Family, for me, are the two pinnacle, like, these are what sitcoms are supposed to be like. Um, other stuff, like, of course, after watching Desperado, I go, man, I'd love to do those kind of movies. Yeah. So, I'm open to anything, but I think more lightheartedness, and I'm not, stuff and, and fun as opposed to, like, the deep, like, soul-searching. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh. Um, and then, uh, and so have you, have you done any parts that, um, that are kind of emblematic of, you know, the, the types that you're like, yes, this is what I want to be doing. Well, the funny enough, the one great thing was Eduardo's project, yeah. the a Padre. That's where it got my, yeah. like, I can do this, but now I need to hit the gym again. So yeah. I'm, don't we all? Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm doing don't DDP yoga again. I, I stopped doing it, but now I'm back into it. So, oh, yeah. Nice. It's, a, it's created by professional wrestler Diamond Dallas Page to get guys to do yoga. Yeah, <laughs> I love it. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. Um, and then John, you have a very similar uh, religious upbringing, yeah. right? Why don't you uh, introduce I, yourself? I, I was raised in the church, the Protestant church, yeah. and um, but always was drawn to stories and books and movies and music. But uh, I went to school in Baltimore. I grew up in Maryland, uh, did the film program at Towson, and then uh, just kind of lost my way. And then you found me and <laughs> was like, come on out to L.A. Yeah. <laughs> and I didn't at first. I went to Nashville uh, and then eventually found my way to L.A. And um, dipped my toes in film, decided I wanted to try the more independent route and not work my way up the studio system as a post-PA. Yeah. <laughs> it was a good experience. But yeah. uh, so now I work IT during the day. Um, and you know, do film stuff on the side when I'm able. Yeah, and this is like our 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 first podcast nice. uh, officially. Um, after <laughs> bless you, and um, uh, we we decided since we made our trek out to move uh, from LA into the Inland Empire. Mm-hmm. Um, I have personally found that it was like the best move. We've yeah. been out been out here for like a year, and. Um, it's really interesting. I mean, it, there's definitely a uh, a changeover 
in culture that happens once you move out of LA okay. and into you know this area, let's say. And I'm sure the same argument could be made when you're going up into the valley and also when you're going down to like Orange County and things like that. But even just that, what happens is you see a lot of people that are um, – grinding it into the industry in a, mm. some form or another. And it could be the industry, it could be uh, getting into the film industry or TV or, or entertainment, but they're also the tech industry and things like that. Right. There's just a lot of people that are transient that come out to LA, like us, like mm. all of us. I, you know, granted, like I lived out here when I was um, in elementary school just for a couple of years. My dad's from Glendale. Okay. Um, and, but, you know, I moved. Because of the military, right? No. Oh. Um, so uh, I'll backtrack. So I... Uh, originally born in arizona and then two months later we moved uh to southeast asia okay. so my dad was a helicopter pilot and so all the best jobs were overseas mm. so and my mom is from indonesia so living in southeast asia was kind of like the normal that was like the the thing but my dad is from glendale um and he grew up out here and you know decided to join the army and all that all that happened before me um, so I lived in South, lived in Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia. Then I moved back here for a couple of years, went to school, and then we moved to Florida. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, moved to Saudi Arabia. Wow. Okay. And I lived in Saudi Arabia in elementary school uh, for three years. And my dad was flying helicopters um, from the smaller hospitals to. We lived wow. in Riyadh, which is like the capital, and um, and so I went to an international school there and did that for a few years. Came back to here, or came back to, yeah, came back to California and then moved to Florida for a bit. Then I um, was uh, competing in, in Wushu and in, in Chinese martial arts. Mm -hmm. um, you say professionally, as professionally as you can, because sponsorships were, you know, something that was a very, like, uh, very hard to get because it's not a, out here in the States, it's not a, a big sport, but in Asia, it's a big sport. So okay. I, w I did manage to get sponsored. Um, and uh, and I was able to go to China a couple times and train with the Beijing team and all that. So wow. I traveled. Um, I thought I was going to go into Wushu professionally. Then I was like, that's not really a future that yeah. I can see myself doing because I want to tell bigger stories, yada, yada. Um, Wushu, is that the one that uh, Jet Li? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So uh, Wushu is basically is just martial art in mm. you know like in chinese but the the idea is that uh there's um wushu makes up all of the chinese martial arts okay so there's different types of wushu there's also internal and external what they call internal and external like taiji shingi bagua those are like the mm. internal arts so you ever seen the movie the one <laughs> oh the jelly the movie? one yeah okay okay so yeah. there's a it, that's actually probably the most uh the the uh, aesthetically the easiest way to explain internal versus external martial arts. Uh -huh. So there was two versions of him that wound up being the ones that they were fighting against. And actually a, right. friend, a friend of mine was one of the uh, um, stunt doubles, I guess, or the body doubles for, for him. And so he was doing a style called Bagua, which is an internal art. And it's a very like cyclical ba based on like the eight trigram, you move in circles and okay. do all these like, you know, movements of like, there's, there's lots of cool history and stuff behind it. And then there's Xingyi, which is like a very linear, like rooted into the earth. And, you know, there's a lot of cool mythology in, in Chinese martial arts, which oh, yeah. is what I loved about it so much. And then he's ver and then it shows him versus itself. And the subtext of it is this internal battle because he's fighting himself. But right. he's fighting all the versions of himself using internal martial arts. Super cool mm. um, idea. So but... Kung Fu. Yes, it is. Is that a sub- is that under Wushu? Uh, well, or is it a gong, term? gong fu, like a Cantonese gong fu, is basically just having a good skill at something, oh, yeah. mm. and it became kung fu when uh, I, I would say probably is Bruce that just Lee a westernized, yeah, colloquialism, yeah, um, yeah, I, and and it did get related to you know martial arts because of the world, you know, culture of it and Bruce yeah. Lee and things like that, but yeah. Um, but so there's a sport of wushu, and that, and then in China, the sport mm. of wushu is really big. Actually, in Russia, China, um, and um, uh, Japan, it's pretty big. Korea. There, so there, there's uh, there's the Pan American Games where they compete big scale. Mm. Um, I was actually in China when they announced that China got the Olympics in 2000. Uh, when was that? In 2002, 2003, or something like that. So for the 2008 Olympics, I believe. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I was I was there in Beijing. I video footage of the whole thing. It was awesome. I was like, oh my gosh, Wushu is going to be an Olympics. Maybe I'll be an Olympian. I can represent yeah. the U.S. team, and that's where I was heading. Okay. Um, and uh, and so uh, I was you know drilling into 
figuring out that that's what I wanted to do to compete and, and all that. But then there was lots of things in the background that made it where Wushu was not introduced in the Olympics. Because if you mm. think about every host country introduces a new sport, okay. why is it China didn't? Mm. Yeah. So um, I don't know much about the politics besides the hearsay of it. Okay. Um, but the behind the scenes of what China was doing to prepare for it was amazing. Like the training they were doing where they were having, where, you know, a lot of the Wushu performers, um, they would put rebreathers on them and they would monitor like heart, like they would, they were bringing the science into the art, which was mm. fantastic because the sport of Wushu had always been about that. So there, there was, there was a lot of that stuff I was really leaning into. And that could be a whole other podcast. I could, I could talk about that stuff. Um, so yeah, at the end of the day, we should, wasn't introduced into the Olympics. It became a demonstration art and right. sport. Right? And, I, and I guess that's a question because I think I've seen a lot of wushu, but it's more instead of really combat. Is that correct? It's not more true. Like... There's so there's okay. in the sport of it. Um, there's sanda, uh -huh. um, which is the is full contact fighting. You're on a okay. raised platform. You could punch, kick, and throw. Um, and it's like kickboxing with a little bit of like um, with throwing. Uh, okay. there's not it, there's not a traditional like ground fighting aspect because once you throw then it becomes almost like judo where you get points for it you can throw people and kick people off okay. the platform yeah so that's that's kind of cool um and then there's uh talu talu is like the the performance side of it so it, you think of it as like a gymnastics floor routine so there's you have to do a certain amount of things you have to hit a certain corners and mm -hmm. there's lots of structure behind right. a lot of that sometimes it used to be where they would everybody would perform the same compulsory routine, and then you would ju ju you would get judged on all kinds of things. Right. But now they've changed it. It's been a few years that I've known. So now they've mm -hmm. changed it to where you just have to hit a certain amount of things, and you can do your own routine mm -hmm. and all that. Anyway. But so, like in Wushu, like if you had an opponent, mm -hmm. you more concerned about getting points, or you concerned about like taking them out, like Depends. Not, knocking Two them out. Two different things. So. The, the ones that I I gravitated towards the oh. performance art of it. The, okay. the 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 forms were like, to me it was like it it was a, it's a performative art. Right. You're you're basically doing this display of telling a story about what a battle was looking like. Oh, okay. Based off of somebody's version, which is why you have things like drunken style, mm. praying mantis. Like nobody's fighting like this, yeah. and like like I fought like a mantis. Uh huh. Okay, but. Like what you can do is you're basically like like dance. There's modern, there's ballet, there's right. jazz. Like there's different aesthetic styles to a lot of those things, and that's what makes it super interesting because you're bringing the mythology back into martial arts. It okay. becomes an art form. Yeah, I love that. Um, I love the storytelling aspect of it, and it's incredibly physical and demanding. And they learn from everybody. Like there's they when I was um, training at the Shirta High Sports School, which is like the main sports school in Beijing, uh, they would bring in people. And uh, like there were there was uh, there was a whole group of um, capoeira guys they would bring in, mm. so there was a, the whole capoeira team they would bring in, and then they would trade movements and, and things, and like oh we can incorporate that into this new thing, right? It's cool, super cool. Um, so yeah, I was massively massively into that for for a bit, and also like thinking oh maybe I can you know be part of a stunt team or mm. you know didn't work out that way i wanted to tell stories i always right. did want to tell stories and so that just wound up being the through line of it but long story short i will uh so fast forward um did martial arts like you know for for a lot of that time but i was in florida doing that and traveling a lot um and then uh, i was in the military for a bit so i lived in italy mm. for three years i made a movie out there and what did you back. do in the military i was a journalist oh okay yeah, I don't. I guess we've never had this conversation. No, no. Super interesting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, so you are more like Tim Pool than uh, <laughs> like Tim Pool. <laughs> yeah, we just need to get you a beanie, man. Yeah, <laughs> you should cosplay as Tim Pool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was. Uh, yeah, I was a I was a broadcast journalist in mm. the um, in the Navy. Okay. Uh, and now now Navy journalism is not real investigative journalism. We'll say it's public okay. relations, basically. Got you. Um, you know, so there I, I do know some people that became investigative uh, as investigative journalist as you could while in the military mm -hmm. it's very limited billets for that most of it is public relations built um did any of them disappear uh i, I have some stories sure oh. like i know a, a chief that was in um i believe it was Af in afghanistan and he was um he was in a carpool that was supposed to go in one direction they took him in another direction it was oh. going right into um taliban territory Oh yeah, he was like it was wow. this whole story, and he was like, "Oh my gosh, I'm probably gonna get beheaded." And wow! Because that was right around the time that they were publicizing a lot of this stuff. 
Oh, yeah. Um, and, you know, making, if you're an American, and especially mm-hmm. a man, if you're an American military journalist, oh, man, like, you were a prime target. Yeah. Luckily, it didn't work out that way because his driver actually was just like, no, they were this way. We're going to go this way instead. Went through the way that they shouldn't have been. And so he was telling me the story about, like, having to dodge a lot of this stuff just to wow. get to the point of contact of where he was. That He, he, was, he was a journalist, though. Um, uh, so, there, yeah, we, there, there's, there's some stories. Now, the stuff that I did was mostly public relations. Mm. Um, I do spots, uh, which are, you know, like glorified commercials um, for AFN, uh, American Forces Network. And okay. um, that was basically their version of cable. You know, mm. so they got to watch all of our crappy uh, spots that we all did, yeah. which uh. is which is great. So I'm probably still on TV somewhere in, in Middle East and hey. Africa and Europe and stuff because uh, they recycle those things. Um, yeah, uh, but I did that for three years, and on my nights and weekends, I made a movie. Um, it's this quirky horror movie, okay, and uh, that became my film school. And so, nice. um, yeah, it was a full length feature. Uh, got written up. There's in the newspapers and all oh. that kind of stuff. And in, in Italy, we had a whole premiere. You still have it? Like, oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, dude, oh, go yeah. watch it later. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. yeah. Um, this was in 2005. Okay. Pre YouTube. Oh wow. Yeah. yeah. 2005. That's right. What... It, isn't that weird to put it in perspective? Yeah. Right? It's like, oh yeah, that was before YouTube. Yeah. Before YouTube. What? What was life? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, the thing too, before YouTube and all that, there's like AOL. Yeah. Like, <laughs> hey, well, yeah, pro- well, I think we, there was a gap, right? Yeah, was, but it was just like the, the the things that were popular then no longer exist. Like, yeah, you know, Proge- Prodigy was a internet company, and all these internet Prodigy, companies. Prodigy, yeah. yeah. Um, what was that? GeoCities? You remember? Oh Geo-Cities? yeah, I had yeah. a GeoCities. What was the site? orange? What was the orange internet provider? It was like a competitor, I think, to AOL. No, not Singular. Maybe it was Singular. 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 It could be also different regions. Yeah, that's true. true. So like, um, but. Yeah. Sorry. And yeah. 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 So, um, Wait, so I get question. How mm-hmm. did you two, did you not go to USC? No, no. I, uh, Andrew and I met in Maryland. Okay. Uh, I still hadn't left home yet. Well, I technically left for like a semester in Nashville and then went home again. Uh, I was John Phobia, Michael. Oh, yeah. I was at, <clears throat> I was at Anne Arundel community college before I transferred to Towson, I think, or maybe I had just transferred to Towson. I forget which school mm-hmm. I was at. One of the two. Um, and I just started at Apple Retail, uh, and we met in Apple Retail Core. <laughs> oh, you guys, were you Yeah, so, okay. um, yeah, when I, got out of the, when I got out of the military, um, I was in D.C. and uh, I had a billet that was at the Pentagon. Hmm. And so that was my, my last um, billet. And, uh, What's so, a billet? Oh, that's like your job. Oh, okay. Descri- like where you're going to go, oh. like your assignment. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. Um, and uh, so I was stationed um, and uh, to be um, head of the, the I was the one Navy guy that was um, head of our department in the uh, combat camera for the Marine Corps. Okay. And that was an, an administrative uh, billet uh, assignment that um, and I don't remember why it was there. It's a unique, really unique billet. Um, but because it was an all Marine Corps billet, but I was the only Navy personnel there. Okay. So, um, yeah, was anyways, I, I was there, uh, you know, at the Pentagon for a few years and then got out and then I got the job as like a teacher, a creative is what they call it at Apple. Mm. Okay. So, yeah. I have a buddy in Dallas who does that. Yeah. It's fun. <laughs> it was, it was a good, it was a good experience. It was, mm. it was, it's a lot of fun. And John and I met there. Yeah. Um, okay. It was, uh, middle of a blizzard somehow. They still called on core and I rolled in and. Okay. Gina, Gina Bernetti was playing uh, the Apple <laughs> Hi-Fi, and I was like, this guy's got a Fallout lunchbox. He seems cool. Yeah, I brought, yeah. I, brought, I had a Fallout lunchbox that I brought in. <laughs> yeah, so let's, let, I was fascinated. Which first impressions? You guys first met, now that you've had this history of knowing each other for all these years, but what can you think back what your first impressions for each other? It's like, oh, was, Fallout. Okay, January 2010, so it's been a while. Mm-hmm. Uh I think I mean I remember the Fallout lunchbox. What hat were you wearing? It was 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 it was it the God Marines hat or the no was idea. It the bad no it wasn't bad robot but you might have had a bad robot T-shirt or Rocket Papa T-shirt or something which is funny for an yeah um, I don't remember I just remember I was like oh he likes stuff uh, he seems cool and I I just remember like oh wow this guy's done some cool stuff like yeah I, and I remember like connecting like the first day or two of yeah. the training but then i think we just ended up chatting over time we're like oh we have enough in common yeah and chatting over time and uh that kind of spread over into once we started working at the store like officially because i think the training was like three 
three days, five yeah, days, something so. like that. Yeah, I was like. And I just remember it was like in the middle of there were like a blizzard was receding from mm. uh, I think the first day maybe was canceled or a few days after that was canceled because of the snow. Mm. Um, East Coast problems. Oh man. Uh, well, for, yeah. for me, I always like the especially loving comic books, fandom, yeah. movies. When you you meet somebody that gets likes the same thing you do, there's a special bond that's created. Oh, of course. And like yeah. oh, yeah. like you know, you can say it's not. It's beyond just a generic, like, hey, oh, I like these movies or whatever, but like, oh, yeah, if, if you know the deep cuts, and then you see somebody else that likes the deep cuts, you're like, friendship? Yeah. Oh, do we just become best friends? You yeah, know. it's like the Care Bears. It's yeah. like, I remember, yeah. I'm trying to remember moments. I mean, there was, I feel like we had already hit it off pretty well, but I feel like a key one was... 2011. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, about, I probably like, I was, yeah, it was like New Year's 2011, so we'd known each other for literally like a year, and you're like, hey, we're going to me and my friend Steve were going to go get Korean barbecue for New Year's. And I was like, I've been wanting to get Korean barbecue for, I think it was like, I remember like 2008. You'd never had it. Right? I'd never had it. Yeah. And I remember seeing a news thing in, in Maryland about some Northern Virginia Korean barbecue. And I was like, ooh, the beef tongue looks really good. <laughs> um, I want to try that. And it had been on my list for, I think it was, I remember being like circa 2008. So about three, four years. And I was like, yes, I'm down. And it was like one of the best New Year's Eves ever. <laughs> oh, so good. And it was like, it was snowing. So it was just like, mm. You know, crisp. We got really drunk off of soju. Oh, came back. Yeah, and, yeah. Steve, st- was it Steve or you that started singing? Oh, that song? it was my song. <laughs> yeah, I had I, and I had some 2011. 2000- yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I had some 2011 song. I was like making up on the fly. You just kept oh, yeah. like repeating. It was, it was very funny. Yeah, had to be there. Um, had to be there. <laughs> the, the reason I bring that up because that's how me and Eduardo, the how we knew each other, yeah. met. Because I auditioned for his project El Padre, and then we were just talking and Robert Rodriguez and like throwing things out, and I could see like okay. You know about Chai on Fat. You know about this cool yeah. stuff, and he I knew about wrestling, and he knew about wrestling. So we're like, okay, this is connecting. And then I remember when I first met y'all at that house that you lived in off of USC, the Purple House. Yeah, that's what we called it. Yeah. yeah didn't, so, it, didn't it get demolished afterwards? I no, I think someone it, bought it. Yeah, and they renovated it. Okay. Chance, chance. Um, so you met Andrew before I moved out here? Yeah, okay. briefly. Briefly. Okay. Briefly, yeah. we yeah. like passed by because. When we were doing that project, yeah. we were just we were all so busy running yeah. around trying to get all our stuff done. Mm. So I I remember I remember meeting oh, you. Oh, was a Padre a USC thing? Yes, yes. Nice. it was yeah. his uh, one of his final things. No, right? they called it three ten. So okay. it's basically the mid project, but it really is like your unique project. You're supposed to do within five minutes with a lot of constraints. Mm. Um, so yeah, mm. and. Uh, it's funny you mentioned that about Eduardo. We're going to sit here and talk about Eduardo. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so orientation day. Oh, um, Eduardo. Yeah. <laughs> orientation day. Uh, Eduardo and I meet. Uh-huh. Right. And so um, I sit down in, in our group or whatever, and he's. It was just me, him, and, and a few of a few of others, a few of other, few others of ours. And like, uh, so I was like, man. So I just saw Sam Raimi. Uh, and I did. Wow. Sam Raimi was ahead of me with his son, checking his son in. Wow. Okay. And I was like, oh my God, that's Sam Raimi. Uh-huh. And, and so I was telling our group that, and I was like, yeah, I just saw Sam Raimi. And most everybody goes, who's Sam Raimi? Oh, wow. <laughs> and then I was like, this is the film table, right? Yeah. This is a, this is, a, you guys all got Adam accepted, and... <laughs> right? Yeah. Like, I was like, yeah. what am I? And then Eduardo was like, <laughs> Did Evil Dead? He did. I was like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> and then, uh, and then, so he wow. had this like snarky, yeah, he had yeah. this kind of snarky attitude or whatever. We start, so we go on our little tour or whatever, and you can, that's the same thing. It was like, mm-hmm. you can tell because um, he was like, he, he's like, yeah, you know, like Robocop. And then I was like, what do you know about Robocop? He's like, what do you know about Robocop? And mm-hmm. then we like, I was yeah. like, oh yeah, well, <laughs> and then we started like one upping each other. Yeah. And you can just, you tell, like, that was, that's that same thing you're talking about, where it's like, oh my gosh, like, yeah, finally, like, we're aligned on mm. all those things, yeah. those things that we love, like, John Woo, Chai and Fat, like, huge part of my childhood. Oh, yeah. Um, and Ringo Lamb and, like, all the Hong Kong cinema was a huge part. Uh, also, like, um, just weird subversive movies and, mm. and cinema, like, everything from, like, 80s and 90s, I was just, like, all about. Robocop was the reason why I wanted to get into movies. Okay. Yeah, so, so like. So that's your uh, gateway? Well, kind of, I mean, there's many gateways. There's okay. two things. It was like, one of them was uh, Scream Greats, which was this Fangoria documentary. Okay. And I didn't know that it was a documentary when I got it. So mm. um, the the short story of this is uh, when I lived in Saudi Arabia, we would come back to the States 
and out here there's a place called Ken Crane's. It was called Ken. I don't know if you know if they're around. Ken Crane's Laser Disc Emporium. Yeah, uh, laser disc. Yeah, yeah. yeah I laser. Think they're around anymore. No, they're not laser discs. Right? It may have. Uh, it may have come and gone and come back. <laughs> right. Yeah. So my dad would be like, "Hey, choose a couple movies or okay. whatever." He would choose a couple movies, and I saw the cover of this, and I still have the VHS of this. Uh-huh. And the cover's amazing. It's got like what I didn't know is Tom Savini's face and surrounded by monsters. Okay. And I was like, I got to get this. Yeah. So I gave my dad the sales pitch. I was like, oh yeah, I've seen this movie. This is like, you know, he's got, <laughs> it hadn't seen it, brought it back. I went all the way back to Saudi Arabia, played this thing and it's a documentary. And I'm like, what oh. is this? And it's okay. about making movies, special effects. And I was mm. like, oh my gosh, that's a thing. You know, eight years old. Right. So we watched Robocop one day and my, and you know, we do this with a few other movies, but he paused it right on the point when he gets his arm blown up right uh-huh. and on laser disc it's crisp so he right. pauses it and it's like crystal clear uh-huh. and he's you know backtracking and forward tracking frame by frame right and he's like how do you think they did this and i go well, what do you mean and we just started talking about it like that and then it just solidified like mm. not only like m- movies are made right and it's made by really creative people that are it's magic it's illusion right and it's just like that it just those things in my brain you can tell like they just you know connected dots mm. and i was like you know, wanting to write stories and do all that stuff. And it was also, at the time, it's really influential when you're, like, wanting to play. You know, you're wanting to make things up and yeah. things like that. So, That's awesome. yeah, it was a huge, huge part of it. Paul Verhoeven, like, like uh, yeah, there's just so much. Um, so, anyways, going back to, you know, meeting Eduardo, it was, yeah. like, breath of fresh air. Of course, we became, like, instant best friends, hanging uh-huh. out, like, you know, talking movies and stuff like that. Um, and uh, and it became that same thing. And, it's, and you know, it's really weird is that it is, you would think in L.A. there would be, and, and I'm sure there are, massive amounts of nerds. Right. It's hard to find. Well, yeah. I will tell you, especially as an actor, the things I like and the conversations I like to have, a lot of actors don't like having those conversations. That's bizarre. Yeah, because they either they are fans, but they, like I have a friend who's a working actor. He goes, son, you think about movies a little bit too deep. And I'm like, what? That's the whole point of movies yeah. is to talk about what you think the artist, I mean, the director meant or the writer wanted, and and how they, the story and all that. They're like, it's just a movie, dude. I'm like, no, it's yeah, not just a movie. I mean, granted, there's the popcorn films that are purposely designed that way, but there's other films that aren't. Yeah, that yeah. are supposed to make you think and make you wonder. Okay, and like I just saw two movies that I literally left going, what the fuck. <laughs> One was Men, oh, the Alex seen Garland it. movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the other one is Crimes of the Future. Oh, both movies I want yeah. to see. And I just went, walked away going, I'm going to have to watch YouTube videos to explain <laughs> the movie to me because I don't get it. Yeah. It yeah. Kind of, yeah. But uh, Well, that's the thing about, you know, it, it's interesting because you take the idea and uh, about movies. Movies are like, that's the shared dream. Right, that's the thing that everybody experiences in a safe place without experiencing it. So it's this illusion of memory. Mm-hmm. Everybody comes out of it with a certain experience. Uh, usually, what breaks the illusion is when you know you see how it's made. Mm-hmm. Right, you see the green screen. You right. know, like it's done. It's fake. Uh, when you watch enough of them, you kind of look beyond it sometimes. Hopefully, and I think a lot of creators usually and especially like when you listen to like tarantino interviews and things like mm-hmm. that he's really good about going like just layering it and yeah. he can explain he goes you know what i love the way they did this part of it and he kind of like you know some of the things you have to let go because they're you know they're made by a committee of people and mm-hmm. sometimes it works sometimes it doesn't when it works it's brilliant and that's the cool thing about movies now we have video games and those are a different type of shared experience right uh but it is still a shared experience but the only problem is is that you have those in in isolation usually Mm. you know and and that's what that's why video games really can't be movies and everybody thinks that um you know movies are going to go away and you and I have had this conversation um where it's like we've had this debate about where our movie theater is going away um, yeah, and, I don't think so. Well, I kind of do. Okay. Yeah. And I'm in okay. the middle of, <clears throat> I think there'll be less, but there'll still be a lot of them. Now, when you mean as far as the, to see like even bigger productions, like the Marvel movies and all that, they're mm-hmm. going to scale back and no more, no more AMC. I mean, that's going to suck for you and me because. No, oh, no, I'm yeah. also. Okay. Yeah. But, uh, uh no, 
um, what I what I mean by they're they're not gonna go away, go away. Mm-hmm. I think we're the gonna me- have the megaplex will be called. Yeah, they'll, so they'll still be you know your new Beverly's and your okay. Yeah. Well, the, um, I hope uh, this is a hope actually. Yeah, yeah, I feel pretty confident. I mean, yeah, the resurgence post post COVID again. I think that will die down eventually, but I think there will always be people who want to go see movies with a bunch of other strangers and have that shared experience mm-hmm. because it, they're nerds yeah. <laughs> like us. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I have the AMC A list and that's like, for me, it's, it's especially being a religion major, what I'm about to say is going to be blasphemous, but I apologize. <laughs> I, mean, I have one in my pocket too. So. But um, <laughs> going to the movies is like going to church for me. Yeah. Because I'm going there to listen to some, an experience that I, a story that I don't, know about maybe it's whether it's social issues or a a creative idea or whatever and being introduced and i'm going okay is this resonating or doesn't okay if it doesn't okay that was fine okay but when the movies do resonate you you your mind changes Mm -hmm. you're like i never thought about that yeah i never wow and that's why for me i hope movies theater never go away because it's uh almost a sacred uh, place yeah. for movie fans to go. Yeah, it's what like a you... single focus of meditation. Yeah. Well, this well, is. I would say what you said was my ADHD brain, like yeah. tying a bow on the whole conversation. Yeah. But uh, what you said about the you know the movies of the shared the shared dream, it just reminds me of the line, uh, David Lynch's line from uh, Twin Peaks: The Return is, "We live inside a dream, but who's the dreamer?" Mm-hmm. And that made my brain, <laughs> my ADHD brain, uh, think about. Um, and I've I've heard this so many people say it, but you know, going back to my upbringing and you know specifically Christianity, but religion in general, um, uh, Dorothy Sayers, who was like I guess if I remember correctly, was friends with like C.S. Lewis and Tolkien. I think mm-hmm. I can't remember if she was in the Inklings or if she was just kind of like adjacent. But uh, she's written some of my favorite like detective novel series. Mm-hmm. Uh, but she also wrote a book, if I remember correctly, called "The Dogma Is the Drama," and the whole idea is like. Uh, history is God's story that he's telling. Like the redemptive mm. arc of human history is the biggest story that mm. we're actually living through. And uh, so that was an interesting concept and it made, always made religion a little bit more interesting to me because I'm like, I like stories. And you're yeah. telling me that the big man upstairs is the ultimate storyteller. That's a little bit more appealing than some dusty, like, well, sure. you have to blah, blah, blah. Yeah. I well, thought that was cool. Uh, yeah, I... I, I'm not personally um, incredibly religious, mm-hmm. but I am fascinated by the mythology of religion. Yeah. That's not to put. That's not to say that fake or real or whatever. Who knows? None right. of us know. Yeah. But the mythology to me is the most important part. This is that Joseph Campbell mm. influence of it. You know, where it's like we've all had a shared, learned experience of living on in the world. Why is it we're only focused on this segment? Right. Why are why aren't we listening to other segments and learning from that as well? We can all learn. Like, right. There's no shortage of learning, and you can take those experiences and you know it, they sometimes they're so foreign that you'll never get it. But that's also part of being human and figuring out like the world is so vast and so yeah. amazing. This is where movies come in actually. Um, you know, and like I love the push of the diversity in storytelling, um, and uh, you know without getting into the political side of it Mm -hmm. there the it's really interesting when you start allowing the democratization of uh movies where people you can put cameras in more hands now more people can tell unique stories that's a good thing and then more people will be able to get better with visual effects and things like that so they can tell their bigger stories in bigger and and you know in their own custom worlds and Mm -hmm. things like that we're all heading towards that so Going back to like movies or you know movie theaters are going away. I feel like yeah, movie theaters are going to be scaled back um, because it's just not sustainable the way it is right now. But mm-hmm. I think the bigger thing is that more movies will be made. Like we're gonna we're already heading in that direction with streaming. But like the long tail of movies, you know, it's basically that there are more things and more niche audiences that will be created. Right. There's always going to be some form of you know like corporatization of the movie part of it right, right. where the studios are going to do whatever they're going to do I, you know, i'm sure that's probably going to be around but what happens when you know all three of us can open up our own micro studios mm. what does that do and what you know we're not going to get why would we need to get our movies into movie theaters when the internet is going to be even richer than it is now in the experience of it 
like Web3 and things like that and mm -hmm. for in AR and VR, everybody's going to have that, you know, unique thing, but what's going to tie it all together? So right. I think more so you're going to see uh, people get together, like staying where they are, but get together online uh -huh. and share those experiences in real time. Oh, well, see, I kind of have a disagreement with that because take, for instance, the new Batman movie, right? I know friends that waited till it was on streaming to watch it. I'm like, you don't understand. You have to watch that movie in the theater. Yeah. For the number one purpose, your sound. Yeah. That the sound in that movie made the movie, especially with how he was moving, how he was walking, and especially, particularly when the Batmobile turned on. Oh well, and, you're and you're you talking about the fidelity yeah. of it. Yeah. And I'm okay. saying that that's going to be better for everybody. Like, look, we have a theater in the house, right? right? And I'm very tuned into wanting to have that experience. Yeah. Um, so fidelity aside, the, the technology of that, right. I, I'm, I'm saying, like, okay, so movie theaters, like, I'm sure every community will probably have their yeah. one movie theater that everybody goes to. Yeah. Uh, but I think the majority of it, and it's already happening with streaming uh -huh. and things, the majority of the content of things are going to be distributed. Right. TVs are better and cheaper. And yeah. you but know, his counter argument when I make the argument you're making, yeah. and he's got a point, is TVs get better and cheaper, projectors get better and cheaper, surround sound gets better and cheaper, but also VR. Oh, yeah. yeah. If you put a two OLED high res, you can't tell the pixels anymore. Okay. You might as well be, and then you can be in a movie theater virtually with your friends. And that are on everybody the has planet. front row wherever they want. Right. Have so, you ever tried um, watching? Uh, now, right now, the experience like big screen uh -huh. and stuff like that. Have you ever tried that in VR? No. Oh, interesting. Okay. I would love to see how you, what you would think of it. Yeah, I'm down for that. Yeah. I, I guess one of the parts is like when the Batmobile started, right? Going back to that point. Yeah. The whole audience went, yeah, and it was just that kind of almost like, I'm not the only one. Other people just got turned on yeah. the same way I yeah. did right now. This is awesome. I'm with a group full of people who are loving this movie like I am. Or Avengers and Endgame, when Mjolnir comes into Captain America's yeah. hands. And the whole, I, I literally jumped out of my seat. <laughs> I love it. I couldn't help it. Yeah. I literally jumped out of my seat in uh, two movies ever in my life. Yeah. And the other one was Wind River. Have you seen Wind River? No. Okay. Oh, it's uh, written by Ch Tyler Sheridan. Oh. Yeah. But there's a scene, because I was just so like, yeah. the bad guys were winning. I didn't like this. And then something happened, and they got taken down. And I literally went, yes! <laughs> <laughs> and I felt bad, because I don't like to ruin the movie experience. I, but no, I just, but you are in I, it. I had to let it out. Yeah. And, but when you hear other people respond, it kind of validates. Sure. You know, like, okay, kind of like uh, when you're going to a church. Like, yeah. you hear a word and you needed it, and then yeah. somebody, amen, brother. Yeah. You're just like, okay, I, uh, I don't feel alone. I had that experience in Top Gun. Okay. <laughs> then you won. Uh, like, yeah. I was in tears beginning to end. Oh, and I yeah. don't cry in movies. Okay. Uh, a lot of it hit, a lot of things hit me right. for that movie. Um, and also, like, I saw the original in the theater. Okay. Um, had a long conversation with Jack Epps when I was at SC, like, mm. about Navy, about motorcycle riding, about American culture and things Who's like Jack that. Jack Epps? Uh, he created one of the, yeah, oh, okay. created Top Gun, okay. yeah. First one. Um, and then uh, it, it was interesting because we saw it on Memorial Day, mm. and you know there was just a lot of like flashbacks of military life and camaraderie. Right. And then we saw it, there was a bunch of veterans in the audience, and they were all clapping, and like it was so like, ugh, I I was moved. Right. And I was moved because of the audience. I think if I would have seen that movie by myself, it would have been great. I right. don't know that I would have had the same you know, initial experience of it, maybe I would have, because a yeah. lot of other things hit me. It just all was overwhelming. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, you know, and then the same argument could be made if I, it, let's say I were to see that movie. Have you seen it? Oh, yeah. yeah. See, I saw it twice. I loved it. I know. So, like, yeah. I, I think you could say, okay, the story is like Star Wars, basically. It's like, whatever. Yes, you can, you can, you know, drill it down to its, like, most minimalist thing. You can do mm -hmm. that with any story, really. Right. That's not what makes it great. That's not why it made eight hundred million dollars worldwide. Mm -hmm. You know, at the box office, like it. There's, there is, there is a sense of that culture that it just knew to dial into, and it needed to be in a shared experience. That yeah. was a, that was exactly what you know a theatrical experience should be. It should be a shared exactly. experience of shared interests and culture and values, that is not partisan, mm -hmm. and all of those things. That's beautiful, like on so many levels, because we just we need it. Right. Uh, and, yeah, I think that is that is one of those things. I don't want to see movie theaters go away. That's not my argument. Right. My argument is just, like, it, it, it's it's all cyclical. Like, I think there's going to be a time, you know, when the theaters, this just it's just way overhead. 
yeah. so much stuff that they have to account for. They have to change. And things like, you know, Alamo Draft House is great because they do, they change it a little bit. And also they, they as far as I know, the ones in Austin, you've been to the ones in Austin, right? You're from Texas. I'm from Dallas, so. Um, or do they have, do they have an Alamo in, in Dallas, right? Yeah, I haven't been yet to an Alamo Draft House. I uh, guess I've been. At all? Either. No. I've never been. What? There's one in Maryland now, or Virginia, I think. But I have. Oh know. well. Isn't there supposed to be one in LA? Here's but the interesting. Yeah, yeah, there is one in downtown. They, I think they finally oh, built okay. it. Yeah. Uh, so, Alamo Draft House in Austin is great because, like, you'll go in there and they'll show like short films by mm. local community people. Right. Before the movie, that's awesome. Would you say it's the decentralized mm. theater experience? I mean, that's well, that's <laughs> what much. I think it's going to be, right? It's, They'll so be more and more niche. So yeah. instead of so instead of seeing you know Top Gun, for instance, with mm-hmm. people who are just like chasing babies in the aisle, and people are just like yeah. on their cell phone, it's going to be everyone's there because they want to see that thing. Yeah. So you'll probably like get more. Concert. You'll probably get more of that experience that you had from Top Gun. Yeah. The more niche things you get, because I mean, I, I, even in Baltimore in 2013, I think I saw they had a series. Um, some of the local. Uh, semi well-known artists had a series called Gunky's Basement, and it was like them playing their favorite movies on uh, on film. So I saw Die Hard, Twin Peaks, Firewalk with Me. I think one other thing. And then when I saw Twin Peaks, Firewalk with Me, it was like, hey, they did a little intro, you know, introducing it. And they're like, who here has never seen it? And like two people raised their hand, and they're like, <laughs> buckle up, <laughs> buckle up. But it was it because like, everyone in there was there because they knew what they're getting into, and there was like crowd response, but it wasn't, you know. The annoying, the the downsides of going to a megaplex where like oh there's just oh we, we randomly bought our five year old to this rated R film mm-hmm. because it's just that yeah. sort of thing will be less and less I think so yeah. yeah I think the idea of you know getting out of the house it, like you check you do the check boxes of what movie theaters you know it's a couple hour getaway it's escapism some people blah 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 you you can dial in all those things there's lots of things that we can do to do that. Right. Um, how can they change movie theaters to make them exciting? And yes, make better movies for one thing, mm-hmm. uh, and you know, make more of them so that they go into theaters. But like streaming, I think as much as they're going to try to, you know, especially with Netflix getting hit and things like that, and like mm-hmm. you know, I, I think what it feels like the changing is we're all trying to figure it out and there's a battle between the mass distribution and Mm. the decentralized distribution. Decentralization is always going to win. Like in the long run, decentralization wins the internet won, right? There's all, Mm. and there's a battle of centralizing it in a lot of ways, but I think my hope and also just seeing how things go is that when you start to allow more people to take responsibility of themselves and doing and and their part in it, Mm -hmm. we'll get there. And then we'll get there in a beautiful way because other things will be invented to help bring that community together and people will holistically do it. And I, this mm. is, and maybe this is the libertarian in me, okay. but it's like, you know, these smaller communities and, and bringing people together in, in their own communities rather than it being it's like in, in mass and large, I think we're going to come back to community focused events mm. and movies and things like that, where people can do that. And crypto might play a part in that. NFTs might play a part in that. VR and AR might play a part in that if they, you know, if, if certain things wind up being social, like you go like social media, you know, we're in social media 2.0 or whatever. Like when we go to social media three and web three, mm-hmm. you're going to start seeing, I think more like, like meetup groups. And mm-hmm. yet they don't have to be like in person. Like, okay, here's a good example. Trying to find nerds in LA, uh-huh. you know, we're everywhere. Yeah. How do we all meet up? And you know it's 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 weird because you're not just going to go, hey, are you are you into this? It's not like that. But if you find a way that brings everybody together in, a, in an interesting way, you'll start to the people will start to then meet in those ways. And maybe there need to be safer ways because you know you're dealing with women, men, and all kinds of ages. Who knows? Yeah. You do it. You do it in a way that's like in some type of AR, or VR. Maybe that's a way in. Maybe th- then maybe those communities strengthen. Because you start doing things like these podcasts, everybody's doing podcasts now. Yeah. What What is the need for that? Podcasts are a really great example of this. The fact that we set up a couple of cameras, you know, some basic lights and mics, and we're sitting here nerding out over yeah. stuff, having conversations we normally would, but we're going to put it online. There's a need to put that stuff in front of other people. I think it's like a, it's an act of saying, hey, like find our community. Let's all yeah. like, that's what it is, right? And once you do that, it's a strong thing. And it's a yes and. You mm-hmm. right? You can be a fan of this, 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 and this. And everybody can be a fan of all those things. And 
it's not a competition. There's no competition in this field. That's what makes it beautiful. Right. That's yeah. decent. That's a beautiful <clears throat> decentralization. I think for me, like when I look at my podcast slash YouTube habits, like obviously there's certain seg segments of that are like, I want to learn about this or learn more about this other thing. But there is some of it I just watch because it's comfort viewing basically. Yeah. And I was thinking about, you know, in terms of starting some of my own stuff, I'm like, what's the point? It's oversaturated. But then I realized I watched like three to five channels that effectively cover the same material. But I like, I think maybe it's in an age of hyper, hypercritical, you know, polarizing stuff. I like hearing five different people's positive or mostly positive opinions about a thing I love because mm -hmm. they're all actually different and they'll have, they'll bring their personal experience in and I'm like, yeah, it's, it's not hearing the same thing over and over again. It is, you know, if you drill down to it, yes. But like with the movies, it's like, you know, well, there's only so many plot structures you can do. It's how the details of it. So I think that that's another interesting, that whole, the whole side of hearing different positive takes in an era of like hyper, hypercritical, hyperpolarized. Uh, headlines, like, and I mm -hmm. hope this kind of goes away, but the the monetization of things that happen online is by, you know, really mm -hmm. crazy headlines. Mm -hmm. That's what gets the clicks, right? right? We went from, you know, not too long ago, we had the BuzzFeed, you know, 10 things about this, 10 right. ways of, you know, the lists. Uh -huh. And that list, you know, went to, and then, you know, the headlines in politics. And this is like, this is cash for like all of these companies it was mm -hmm. until now we're all just sick of it yeah the that those are like the ebbs and flows i think we're going to work our way towards what is the natural thing that we're all into we know we can all like you know make a living at and i know everybody has to figure out a way to monetize so they can keep it going and right. you know concentrate and be able to do more of these types of things and i think that's the way in is uh possibly through some type of um, like my my thing is like I think crypto and, and blockchain is the way in to that. Mm. There, I think it's inevitable. I don't know of another technology that's this far ahead and just ready to crack, just ready to open that door. There's the financial side of it, and that's a whole other thing because who knows? Like finances, especially on the global side, is all about power and money, and you right. know, it's a real estate business, you know. But like the technology behind blockchain of being able to track certain things and metadata that's really smart and very secure i think once we get to that point that is going to open up ways for everybody to be able to do these things and be able to monetize throughout the chain of the life of whatever projects that you're doing hmm. and that's where we're going to get to like true decentralization now are the hiccups and all the kinds of stuff sure so going back now to the movie theater hmm. how does that how does that get taken away? You're going to start to see when, when, when more people, let's say, um, let's say this podcast uh, finds its audience, becomes a thing, right. and we've had talks about certain things that we want to create, mm -hmm. right? And that's not necessarily a movie theater. It's a, it's it's a movie. It's all it's a it, it could be a theater experience built into something else. Mm -hmm. So that's where I think I would like to see more of those types of things, and then that becomes the movie theater plus it's like mm. that is part of the experience of whatever it is because uh you want to get people to get out of their you know environment into something that is more community based right uh and i think sitting in front of a screen for two hours is part of something but it doesn't have to be the only thing right yeah, right i think more people will catch on to that like so and also i think for me it's i'm weird because I'm a single guy, no responsibility, and I have an AMC movie pass. So I'm only spending like 25 Same. bucks a month. Same. So going down to the theater to go see a movie is really convenient for me as opposed to somebody who has work schedules, family issues, other things that they have to fit their day around. And yeah. if they have babysitting, that's an additional cost and then yeah. like all these costs. But me, I'm just like, I walk into the theater, cool, I had an edible, cool, excellent, walk out, cool. Yeah. But then some people are like, oh, I wish I could do that, but you don't understand my life. I'm like, yeah, okay, I get it. And I also like the solitude of going to a theater by myself. If there's nobody in the movie, I have this huge screen, I have great surround sound, and there's nobody to, to distract me. Yeah. Because at home, if I'm watching something, whether it's streaming or DVD, oh, I need to go do this pause or just let it play, and I miss scenes in the movie because or in this show but you could if you're in a movie theater and you really got to pee 
Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's but, well, then the... that's where I kind of plan. I kind of know my bladder, yeah. you know, about <laughs> that, at that point. So yeah. Well, yes, I, I think it would be interesting. Um, and we're very close to right to these uh, these display technologies that are going to be like what Apple is going to come out with, or like 8K, mm. you know, HDR, and Sony is already doing that with their new PlayStation VR two. It's going to be, I believe it's an OLED panel that okay. is going to be HDR. So imagine that type of experience in virtual reality. That's going to be pretty mind blowing. And if mm. you can make it, the, if you can then watch a screen in 4K or even 2K, 2K, and you can make it as big or as small as you want, and then you have really great sound, that's going to take away all that experience of like, why do I need to go to the movie theater? Really, you're only going to need to go to the movie theater because you are going to need. You want either the, you want the community experience, mm -hmm. you get out of the house, but you're you're trying to go because you don't have the big screen, right? And then if you have the big screen that's in your eyeballs, yeah, you yeah. Know. I mean, I get your point because you know I just noticed I did, I gave two uh, two things that I, I like the shared experience and sometimes I like being the only person in the theater. So it's like mm. I don't want to say it's contradictory, but it's just funny like. Yeah, and you bring up Depends a great point that. that had if I had this stuff available to me like that at home, would I even need to? Especially right. with gas being it is what it is right now, yeah. driving in a theater when I can just like be at home. Now I've been to some I've been to some uh, theater experiences that take me out of the experience. Mm, exactly. Yeah, and it's been like that the past few times. Bes before Top Gun, there was a few movies we went to, and there were people kicking the seats, or oh. there were people like talking through the movie or making out. There was a couple. Mi we went to go see loudly making out. Apparently. Yeah, <laughs> we went to go see the last James Bond movie, uh -huh. and they were like, you can hear them like, and then they're like slapping, like swapping spit, like yeah, throughout the whole thing. And I was just like, man, like I paid for this, like so. And you know, what are you gonna do? Like everybody's. You could be the rude person, or they, they're they the rude people, yeah. but you could be the one that's just like, stop it. Yeah. But then, you know, then that completely takes it out, because everybody, yeah. so it's a whole thing. Anyways, on top of that, some of the uh, tuning that they do in the movie theaters, once you have your own system, you don't need to spend a lot on it. Once you have your own system, and you're tuning it, then you start figuring out what works for you. Mm -hmm. And then it becomes like your temple at home. Yeah. Uh, not a hard thing to do, but... <laughs> When you, you know, if you don't have the space, which of course, and you've got glasses to do that, yeah, forget about it. That's gonna be everything. Yeah, it's so funny. Like, you know, you think about like everybody was like, first we went to like the movie theater with a big screen, and then we have the TV experience, and then we have the phone, and people are mm. watching. I'll watch stuff on my phone, especially if it sounds really good, like AirPods. Mm. I could put on that noise cancel and get spatial audio. I'm good right. because you're in it, you know. And then going from the phone then to glasses, like of course that's the next that's the next thing. Yeah, I'm still definitely, and I'm curious what the science will be in the long run with like you know someone who's pretty freaking blind mm -hmm. uh, with you know eyesight and the headsets and stuff. I'm sure they'll we'll have more science, but also they'll fix whatever issues to come along. But yeah. I'm very much team. I love my VR headset, but even if it was Chris, crystal clear for movies. If I could come downstairs and watch it on the projector, I'd probably still do that just for it's easier on my eyes, blah, blah, blah. Mm. Um, but, I mean, I like having both. Options are nice. Well, mm. VR is still early. Yeah, exactly. That's the thing. So, what you, you know, you're they're, obviously they're studying how eye strain and things like that. Yeah. I mean, that's the kind of stuff they'll figure out. And then they got to work sure. it into the design of it because you got this big old thing on your face. Like right now, the Oculus 2... The Quest 2 is basically a cell phone on your face, right? They're mm -hmm. still a top-heavy thing, but, you know, now they're making it glasses. So, like, if you can wear glasses like these that kind of wrap around, you know, then maybe that strain won't be there. And maybe right. they offload the processing to something in the back or whatever. Like, they'll figure out that kind of stuff. Really, it's the fidelity. And they the fidelity is already there. Screen technology is already there. So mm -hmm. now they have to figure out how all that fits in together holistically and be able to, uh, you know, what you're hearing is that you basically have, like, the new Apple... Uh, VR AR sets are like having a laptop on your face. Like, what does yeah. that even mean? Yeah. So, uh, next year is going to be interesting, and the year after mm -hmm. is going to be really interesting for uh, that new wave of things. Uh, on top of that, <laughs> well, right now, you mm -hmm. know, everything is down, <laughs> right. but like crypto is like, you know, what is Bitcoin at right now? Like 20,000? 
yeah. 19 or 20,000. That's uh-huh. insane. That's okay. it's really low. It's not quite as low as it was in the beginning of the pandemic, which it probably will get there. Who knows? Mm-hmm. It probably will get there. And then when it retraces back up, you know. Yeah. Um, 19. Yeah, 19 now. I could see it going to 10. Um, and then, you know, and then it'll probably, you know, even out and then it, it'll shoot up. But that's once once crypto gets to that point where they figured it out right. and the governments have all figured it out and however, you know, all the institutions have all figured it out. Um, then we're going to start to see the mass adoption and it'll be like overnight. You'll start to probably see like all these things. Suddenly all these companies are going to start popping up and they already have it on blockchain and everything mm. is already ready to go. And you're like, how, where did all this come from? Right. It's all, it's all being worked on right now. You know, that's, that's, this is, this is the, the engines that are all getting built right now. Um, and this is why I think like the hope of that decentralization is going to come through. It's funny we I, we have our outline for the notes, and I like uh, no no <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we just basically I was like oh I'll just leave it. Yeah. Um, but I'm a huge huge proponent, huge fan, and very optimistic about that decentralized future. And I think that that part of it is just like we've never you know tech, every time we get into more technology, you start to see more freedom happen. Right. I feel like the internet is a great example of that, Mm -hmm. you know? So there are, it's tumultuous, it's weird, it's, it's crazy, it's great, it's bad, it's, it's all, it's everything. Mm -hmm. And before, like having lived before the internet, you wouldn't have been able to dream of what the internet was going to be. Right. Right. You remember how like everybody just like, oh, you're going to go surf the internet and jump on like this, the information super highway. Like it was so clunky. Right. Because we were so single-minded and saying like, this is only going to be a resource of, you know, being mm-hmm. able to, it's like our library, mm-hmm. but it's online. Like that's where we were, you know, mm-hmm. images came like, <laughs> like blocks yeah. of pictures you know. and words yeah. and that's it. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, chat rooms, chat rooms, <laughs> age, sex, location. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, and that's how you met people. And like, yeah. who, who would have thought that that's how you were engaging with somebody. And then somebody you don't even see. Yeah. You're like, you just have an idea of who this person might be, and if you're getting uh, catfished, you know. But <laughs> you have no idea. I mean, but if you're even talking about conversations about oh, your love for stuff, you're you're sharing an experience with somebody you never met, right? Yeah. Which was it's an interesting thing, like a pen pal almost. Well, yeah. and and try to see where that goes. Yeah. You know, where does that go from here? Mm-hmm. Do we go? We we're not going to regress. Mm-hmm. We're going to go into. Uh, What's the next step of that? Right. And that's going to be immersion. Mm. Like being, feel like you're present yeah. in that space. And that's going to change a lot of things for people. That's going to make things happen where you're going to, you're, you're going to probably slow down before you post something online. Yeah. You know, because everything then can get tied back to you. Everybody should have a verified check mark. Uh-huh. Oh, on their Twitter. Think about that. Yeah. Yeah. What happens when that happens? Everybody knows who you are. Yeah. And I, I think that needs to be done. I don't know why they haven't even implemented in some... Yeah. Especially since Google owns YouTube and, you know, Facebook. And this exactly. Is, instead of people having their fake names, why don't you just let them be... And yep. I understand the the lore of anonymity, mm-hmm. but I don't know. Well, like, yeah, there's privacy and there's anonymity that needs to happen. And yeah. sure, like all those things. But like... Uh, you know, and that's that. I think that's where you can definitely have that figured out. Like privacy right. issues are a big thing, and does that get sold off to some company? Like all your information and your data, and what does yeah. that actually mean? Most people seem like they don't care. Like whatever, I'm gonna do the thing. Yeah. Yes, but you know, now you're you're having. You, if you're going to be a participant in a community, then there's a responsibility that you're gonna have, like everybody else. So you want to have that protected. Right. And you also want to be part of that community. So that's where we're all figuring out right now, which is why everything seems so just absolutely insane, which it is. Mm -hmm. Uh, But that winds up, you know, I think it will wind up going to a better place where we will have it figured out. We'll get there. And then people will then the generation of kids that are growing up like this is a good example of like generation of kids that are growing up playing like Roblox and things like that online. And that's how they're talking to their friends. They're not hanging out on Facebook like, you know, like trolling on each other because no, they're like experiencing things with each other. They're hanging out. They're like, you know, that's why like Roblox is so huge. Minecraft is huge. Mm. Um, like Fortnite and stuff like that. Those those okay. shared community game experiences are massive. Billion, billion dollar industries. Uh-huh. Um, there was one called Axie Infinity that was for the crypto space. So there's like 
you can it's it's basically taking the um it, it kind of looks like it has some like pokemon type of like monster collecting you know types of things but you're mm. actually mining crypto okay uh, so you can actually buy Axie Infinity coins and things like that, and then you can mine them in, in this space. And, and so that's kind of interesting. And, you know, right now everything, like, it's hard to go, like, well, where is it going to be? But, like, in this market, this is where, this is where, like, everything, like, tightens down before it, like, explodes, which is what is going to happen. And you're going to start seeing more gaming stuff. Like, there's an engine coin. And that basically is like, you know, trying to be a technology that will help all of these social gaming experiences tie in together. And what does it look like when you par are part of a community, part of a game, mm. and you're also uh, a financial participant in it mm. in a certain way? Steam, actually, in a very, like, low-level way, Steam is doing this, um, where if you're playing a certain game and you get a certain achievement, it gives you cards, and those cards may only be worth like two cents, five cents, 15 cents. If it's a really good achievement that you did, maybe worth a dollar, mm. but you can sell those. You can trade those online. Well, this sounds like ready player one. Yeah. There's probably a lot of things like that. That's... that I mean, do you think it will we'll get to that point or will people have their avatars and be able to even work in this space and yeah. get money and yeah, well, we're already, um, how's the, uh, still going? Yeah. Nice. Yeah. We're, um, <laughs> Yeah, I think. I'll start making it interesting. Um, I think that like, so Ready Player One's interesting because there's mm. because it's a movie and a, you know a book and whatever. There is the the different versions of like dystopia, you know, and also utopia online, mm. right? There's the dystopia in real life versus the utopia online, and that's great for storytelling. Yes, right. and there's probably going to be a version of that. You know, there's no single thing that the world is. That reality that reality is not that simple right so i think what we're going to wind up seeing is that the you the there's no utopia online like you can't say the internet is a utopia oh. right right yeah and it's not a dystopia yeah it just is like yeah. it is like another Earth, there's good and bad yeah it's like <laughs> <And> there's <neutral. laughs> there's a whole like you know range of things and it's a whole world uh -huh. so that's, there's a world underneath the world because there's the whole like pirate bay and stuff like that. Yeah, we, like people the, we don't even see. Yeah, like there's different. Oh yeah, like the there's the dark web and yeah. all that kind of stuff. Sure. Yeah, there's there's dark pockets. You yeah. know, then there's mainstream things like being able to order something on Amazon and go yeah. like, cool, I don't have to go out and get it, and it's cheaper. So, um, yeah, there's there's there it's a lifestyle, mm -hmm. and because of the internet and because of our phones, we're constantly on our phones. See, look at him. Yeah. constantly on our phones. Right. So what does that mean going forward? It means that how do we go away from disengagement to engagement mm. and still do that? Now, it's going to take a brain shift, and it'll probably take some actual technology like glasses mm. and some type of brain interface so that we can engage in reality, in like reality plus. And the experiences of VR are those getaways. Those are our arcades. Those are right. our um, movie theaters. Those are all those things. Uh, I mean, that's where I see it going. Mm -hmm. um, and what does that mean for reality? Well, it's like the reality will change. Maybe malls will become something else. Maybe, you, you know, you'll have QR codes that will... Have you played the game of Watch Dogs? Not yet. Oh, okay. there's, a, there's an interesting thing in Watch Dogs where you can actually, like, as you're going to do your thing, you can play these AR games in it that okay, give nice. you those experiences because, you know, you're nice. tapping into it. Yeah, yeah, so it's, it's cool. But I, I feel like there's going to be, like, AR parks. Okay. Right? So just, like, look at Pokemon Go as a great example. How many, you know, remember when Pokemon Go was a big thing? Everybody went out with their oh, yeah, phones. Yeah. And... <clears throat> and it was right when the pandemic happened and, like, people didn't work. So I'd be walking at night, we exercising people. There'd be a group of like 20 people who didn't know each other. Yeah. We're all just like trying to catch the same. I yeah. It did have like a resurgence. Cause I think it, yeah. it originally it happened out, before like 20, 2015, 2016, it came out. Yeah. And it was like everybody. And then, uh, yeah, I think it was like another wave during the beginning of the pandemic, which was yeah. funny. But yeah, but... Speaking of games, you know what? I, my buddy, Adam and Barbie, uh, introduced me to a Detroit become human. Is that the one where you have three? You play di three different characters, and you, you kind of like, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was a fun game. It's almost Very like a, a choose your own adventure style. Yeah, because like we want to complete the game, and then we all want to switch characters. Yeah, we we just hand off the controller. Okay, 
I'm this character. Can, yeah. You play this character, and you play this character. Story. Yeah. There's um. I think the makers of like Until Dawn. Um. There's some horror ones. Actually, I have them. We should probably try it later. Okay. Um. But it's the same thing where we can have a, we can have a controller and we play through this experience. There's one like The Exorcist. Actually. That's a really cool one. Well, if it's like The Exorcist, I want to play this because yeah. being religion major, I'm like, yeah. I'll see if I can get this demon. <laughs> well, what's cool is that it actually starts off in ancient... Oh. Yeah, so I'll okay. leave it at that. Okay. Uh, so the story's cool, and I, I haven't played past that because I was like, oh, man, we should do this like as a group kind of yeah, thing or yeah. whatever. We could do it on the big screen maybe. Yeah. Oh, so, sorry, speaking of video games and like what, you know, the progression of technology, but also what's old is new is old is new again um i started playing and i'll probably start streaming next week uh the new uh teenage mutant ninja turtles shredder's revenge nice it is the best thing ever but it, it is weird because you know you went from like the arc you went from the arcade where you know you had i guess i think max two player for those for the old turtle arcade games uh-huh. uh so you know like, what if we played on that on the, with the joysticks? Me, like, we could. But, I mean, I, I mean, I'll, I'll eventually get it for Steam uh, when the Steam Deck arrives. But uh, I got it for a Switch just because I had it, and um, you can play up to six players co-op, like arcade oh, style. Nice. But you know, you can all drop in. Yeah. With your Switches, I love think it. online and local. Um, that's so cool. But that game is that game is made with love, like. Nice. All the weird sub characters that have yeah. like one episode of the TV show there, yeah. even in it, it gets. It's really, it's really well put together, and I feel like a lot of games that like just lean on nostalgia never quite deliver. This one, I guess, the perfect balance of mm. the stuff you remember, but like quality of life upgrades and like just uh, a little bit more stuff going on than just the standard gameplay that the you know Turtles in Time had. But mm. it's nice. it's so good. Um, so have you heard? You know, the Steam Deck is. No. Oh, dude. dude. So uh, I'm actually getting mine tomorrow, apparently. Okay. Uh, super stoked. Uh, so um, Valve came up with their version of a mobile, um, portable, PC-based gaming uh, system. But okay. But it's a computer, but it's basically like a Switch, but bigger. Okay. And it has all the features that, you know, um, and it has a custom processor that runs it all and all that. So uh, it's... I we both ordered it, and actually Sarah also we ordered it uh, that morning when it op- when uh-huh. it went online, and I'm just now getting it. Wow. Uh, yeah, it's it, so I'm. This is Q2, um, and I got the 512 gig version, which is like it's the slowest one that's moving right now. Um, and uh, you should be getting yours what next month probably. Yeah, yeah most so. likely next month. So we're waiting on these things, and it's a great because we're like, oh my gosh, finally I get to order. And you get like three days once you get like, hey, you're available to order and place your order. And there's a whole community online, Reddit, and like wow. Facebook groups, and we're all like, everybody's figuring out how to use these things in ways that like they're putting Windows on and they're putting their own games on. Some people have hooked up graphics tablets and use it to use it as like c- content creation because wow. a computer. Uh-huh. Um, but it's also a computer with love because it's a gaming system and you want to take it everywhere with you and play, but mm. also you can work on it. You can plug in stuff and put it wow. on your screen and it's adaptable to all those things. This is, this is what's cool. And what's, it, this is going to wind up like taking the mobile gaming part of it and making it more of just like gaming, just wherever you are and social, socializing the gaming experience. Like uh, I was watching Sarah play the new we'll say the new God of War, but, you know, the latest God of War, the uh-huh. fourth one, that was only on PS4 and then PS5 and then, like, you know, the PC. Is the one with the sun? Yeah. Okay. She's playing that on her, oh, on wow. mobile, and it's great. Wow. And you're looking at that going, like, this shouldn't, like, right now, like, the technology is there now yeah. to have it, but it looks beautiful. So um, that's an interesting, just iterative step that I think, 100 percent everybody is clamoring for in mm-hmm. that experience and it's you know gangbusters like everybody is like waiting for this thing and then it's going to allow more games to be made more indies are going to want to get in the game and start making things because this love of this new system and these new systems there's like there's different i and neo is another one and um they have android versions like mobile gamings have like made an interesting comeback in different ways like there's the new like nintendo watch games Mm -hmm. like you can buy those at target now and like people can like buy those little systems and um you know you can mod other little systems and my friend has this tiny and i forget what it's called but it's literally this big Uh and it's like a little mini game boy thing and you can literally play like on it that tiny would you want to maybe not but it's like on your keychain 
Gotcha. So that's an interesting yeah. culture of the bringing the gaming experience together. Now, so much there's so much um, development that's happening on on gaming, the gaming side of things. What's happening on the movie side of things? This is mm. this is like I'll just keep coming right back to it, where it's like when we start getting the ability to want to create more stories, and they don't have to all be one and a half hour experiences. They can be five minute, ten minute one minute, whatever, yeah. and we and everybody starts creating more of that. Like, YouTube is really the only place people are going to get that type of content, mm -hmm. right? But it's not really that type of content. We're not, we're seeing that, but it's it's so much of other things. But it's centralized as well. Right. So we're going to get to that point, I feel like, where we're going to start seeing all those variances of little micro studio types of things where people can make their own stuff. Mm -hmm. It goes online. It becomes an NFT and then that way the community that supports it also benefits financially, but they're also supporting the content creators and content creators are going to support other content creators right. and it's going to be a back and forth thing. That's, that's where we're going to see the movie, TV, whatever you can, we're calling it movies mm -hmm. and TV. What's really the difference? No, you think about it. Are we calling movies movies? Cause we know movies are an hour and a half to two hours. I know it's a, are we just now? Is it I just mean, a, the David, block of time? David Lynch calls, Twin Peaks: The Return, an eight-hour movie. Yeah. Or fourteen, hour, eighteen-hour right. movie, wherever right. long episodes that is. Yeah, like Stranger Things. That's a, like you know, that's essentially like a ten-hour, twelve-hour movie. Uh huh. Well, you think that TV shows are different from movies is because TV shows have characters, and then you keep putting them in different situations. Well, that's I... a that's a formula. That's an that's episodic. Yeah. Right. Um, so there's there's different things, right? Yeah. If you, I don't know if you watched Love, Death, and Robots. No, not yet. Oh, so good. Okay. You need to see it. We, we should watch a couple episodes. Okay. What's interesting is that that's an anthology. Right. So you have, you know, you've got books that do the same thing, right? Short stories, a mm. book of short stories that are all themed to something. And this one is like Love, Death, and Robots. So it's, okay. it's like, um, you know, it's animation that can be very, very, like you have do whatever you want kind of thing. Um, so there's a, there, and it's all, people can make it violent. They can make it whatever they want. Mm some unbelievably amazing uh, visual experiences that you're seeing in these and the stories just can go this is mm. true sci-fi okay like if you really think about it what is science fiction in science fiction is that ability to tell some type of a human story you hope mm. but with massive ideas about the universe that's the idea of science fiction right, right. you're hoping and then there's hard sci-fi and fantasy and all the variances but that's what you're trying to do so this is the best form of telling those things because you're being able to literally do all those things. Can you humanize a story? And if you do it through animation, mm. that animation could essentially pass as real. And then you're kind of like starting to hit into those like ideas of what is real in these things. You'll mm. have to see it. Okay. Yeah. And you'll, you'll see what I mean. But there's a lot of growth in that space in a major way uh, that is really, really exciting. And there's a, gamif there's a gamified level of that where there's QR codes that you can, like, scan. Okay. And you scan it, and it gives you to an NFT, like, that you can get. I'll, mm. I'll show you one um, that I haven't – I didn't buy it yet, but I was like, oh, I have to, like, see this because now this is the thing – Okay, I'm going to admit something. I'm kind of late to the part. I don't even know what an NFT is. So this is an NFT. <laughs> so this is, oh, my gosh, we have to watch this episode. Okay, but, I mean, what's the uh, difference between you taking a screenshot and saving that on your phone as opposed it's to? It's not that. It's not about that. You can. Look, you can say download it or huh. you can mint it. There's two options. If you huh. download it, it's whatever, it's free. Right. You mint it, then what you're doing is you're basically creating a piece of art that is now incentivized Serialized. financially. Yep, and serialized, and it's now that is you now own it but you can own it by just downloading it right so i don't get the difference. minting it uh -huh. adds all of that backbone that says this is the official thing that you get uh here's a good I example it, i was to say you have, you have a you have, let's say in real life you have a painting uh -huh. you go, i'm gonna sell this painting and someone goes oh, okay well what is it and you can tell them whatever you want about it uh -huh. if you have i, mean, I don't know I mean, I know they do it like Pokemon cards, and I know art art collectors do it too. They have like, oh, this art house says like this is a actual Monet. Mm -hmm. Having that art house back it and say this is legit, this is real, and obviously there's scams and all sorts of stuff. But typically, right. you can say like, oh, we can trust this thing. 
there's an added layer of trust and like the vintage and the the heritage or whatever. Um, I feel like it's kind of like that, where it's like instead of just like oh my god the painting. I mean, like, well, I like the painting. It adds more than just the painting. But, it's, oh, but, that was painted by uh, so-and-so, and there's a history to it, and there's a, a, a validity to uh, it beyond just, I'm, I'm an artist, and I made this, it's, you know, which nothing's, the one isn't, like, better or worse. It's just like, well, what do you want? Do you want yeah. just the painting that some local artist made? That's cool. Or do you want a, a Monet? If, it depends on what you're yeah. looking for. I guess my question is, because, like, a painting you can, uh, uh, yeah. uh, you can physically hold. Yeah. This thing that is uh, on the internet. Well, okay. You can, uh, what is a domain name that you own, uh-huh. right? Or right. you could say digital property. I think is a to say something that's physical versus digital is is, a, is what one is argument. A web store? Yeah. yeah. What is anything that you own online? Mm-hmm. Like you're, you know, you can say a company. But you know, some of them... is that an asset? That's like a thing that you're providing a service, and like yes, you can track that. So digital property is interesting because there's no going back unless we completely get rid of electricity and mm-hmm. the internet and computers, which we're not. So we're only going to go forward. So as to, to you, basically, that has to be the baseline. It's like, look, we, computers exist. The internet exists. Let's move on from that. Where okay. do we go from that? Now, where do we go from that is we go, well, you know, there's the Ready Player One of, like, buying digital clothes and stuff like that. That's mm-hmm. sure. But what's the real value add? And the real value add is that if I'm going to be a content creator in this space, then I go, oh, well, I'm going to basically go, I-, I need to, how do I monetize in this thing? How do mm-hmm. I create, if I create an image and I want to sell it so that other people want to have and own a part of that image, mm-hmm. then you've created a community. Mm-hmm. And you're not going, I'm going to create an image that is for this company, then they're going to sell it for me, or a piece of music, or uh, a movie, or a game, or anything like that. Mm-hmm. So... Um, anyways, lots of other conversations to have with it. Um, the girls are back from swimming, so maybe we should wrap this thing up. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, but yeah, I'm, I, I could I'm, talk I'm, about NFTs yeah. and stuff like that well, for hours. Well, I mean, we totally. Can. You're, you're. I'm really late to the party on a lot of things because you're talking about gaming. I'm, and especially like cell phone gaming. I just downloaded Candy Crush. Like I'm way late. Oh to, yeah, you were definitely way late to the party. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> no, but there's, there's no earlier late. I know, but I'm, just I'm, like, I'm the guy that always is late to the party for yeah. some stuff. Except movies. I'm way ahead of the curve in, in TV shows. And, well, no, movies more than TV shows than my friends. But like, I'm just like I'm playing Candy Crush right now, and I'm like, man, this is amazing. Why didn't I discover this game like five years ago? Or that's hilarious. <laughs> but. Uh, there's lots of conversations around the mobile gaming space that I think are really, really cool, especially when it comes to like some type of like ARG experience. Mm. Like there's lots of, and there's, there's some interesting case studies of things that have done, did, that have done right. Yeah. Um, uh, so yeah, I think that's, that's an actually really interesting way of a uh, form of storytelling as well as like the ARG experience. Mm. Um, yeah, well, I'll have to show you some of those, uh, but NFTs, you know, this is an ongoing conversation for okay. sure. Yeah. And I think like to get your head into it is every, we're all figuring it out. Everybody's yeah. like trying to, but there's a possibility of being able to uh, be part of something that is new and exciting. Mm-hmm. That's sure. That's one part of it. But on top of that, it's really being part of a movement that is great for everybody. I don't know what you, you I don't know of a bad thing that NFTs are for mm-hmm. that. Um, that anybody can make the example of saying, well, this will, this won't work. Like, it, it, why won't it work? Like, we, we could start with those conversations, and mm. maybe that's something to think about. I would love to have those conversations where people are going, well, NFTs, this is just a bunch of, like, vaporware. You can't really say that. You can say people, you know, you could say that about the Internet. You can mm. say that about anything that's new. But when you, have a, when you have a massive movement behind it where people that are creating real technology uh, and real infrastructure – that is backing this thing of blockchain and security, right. it's going to change everything online. Mm. And it will also make everybody accountable. Okay. It will also take away a lot of the ethereal things that we don't trust. It does a lot of things. Mm. Okay. Like I said, those are, that's a much longer conversation, I think, that we can have. Um, uh, and especially in the NFT space, as a content creator, gold. Like that is your gold because you are now you do not have to potentially you don't have to sell your thing to the bigger thing and let them handle all of your administration. Patreon. Patreon's a great example. Yeah. Mm. How did Patreon come out? 
Yeah. Like, and a funny thing, I mean, if, OnlyFans... NFTs could replace it. Yeah, OnlyFans like, oh. has a bad name, but OnlyFans is another version of Patreon. OnlyFans is trying to be Patreon. They just came out during COVID and a lot of other oh, CD stuff, you know, and I'll say CD, but it allowed people to create their own channels, whatever that, whatever those channels may be. And John, how many of those channels are you subscribed to? Oh yeah, to? John, how many? Uh... <laughs> Sex work is valid work. Yes, exactly. But that's what it is, right? Patreon. Yeah. And, you know, those types of things are, that's a, that is an inch forward in allowing people to self-distribute, self-publish, right. self, okay. whatever I it is. I get you now. NFTs now become, that's the thing where you're like, yeah, it has to be an NFT. Mm. There's no, why wouldn't you make it an NFT is really the thing. Especially okay. all of our phones and our glasses or whatever in the future are going to be linked to some type of digital wallet. That digital wallet is going to basically account for all of those investments that you're going to have. The mm. stock market, if you think about the stock market, imagine investing in content as your stock. Okay. That's that's another way to look at it, right? So you're, you're if I were to say there is this, really hot director and you know they're going to blow up in like three years and whatever you're like yep i'm kickstarting it ah okay now kickstarting it they give you incentives they're like hey yeah. if you if you're part of this kickstarter then you know we'll we'll do some extra things you'll get it on cheaper we just you know no whatever maybe make you an executive producer at a certain level sure. like that type yeah, of okay. yeah 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 okay yeah. yeah and then what happens if you own now that piece of property that is like, hey, this is the thing. And you're like, okay, well, maybe down the line I want to sell it. Mm -hmm. And there's another super fan that's like, man, I know they only made like a certain amount and I missed out on it, but somebody's selling theirs. And then they buy yours. Right. The original creator gets a, a portion of that royalty mm. every time it changes hands. Mm. So that's part of the technology that goes into it. Gotcha. Okay. It's cool stuff. Yeah, yeah it's super cool stuff. So, well, this is great. We did yeah. an hour and a half. Yeah. Um, your kiddo's in the background. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, till next time, thank you for being part of our uh, first podcast. Yeah, for sure. Thank you for having um, me on. We'll have to do this again. Yeah. We'll have to part two it because I didn't even get through any of my... Uh, <laughs> I didn't get through any of my... We'll talk about the Steam Deck. My, my outline. <laughs> can we, we can talk about the Steam Deck next time when I actually can have it. always get high and then in a couple hours do this all again. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> 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 episode two. Episode two. <laughs> yeah. All right. All right. Thanks, y'all. Yeah.